Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the third installation of our weekly virtual webinar series for the 15th annual Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network Conference. Um, apologies that you are seeing my face again, um, uh, but we had some facilitation issues, and I'm very much looking forward to facilitating this really important conversation with you all. And we have a great lineup of experts and speakers. And we're looking forward to conversation um, with you about this really important topic. I'm Johanna Miller. I'm the Energy and Climate Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. I'm also one of the coordinators of the Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network, which many of you are involved in and know is the network of community energy committee leaders and partners who collaborate with those um, community groups like Vermont Council on Rural Development, Efficiency Vermont, um, vital communities and the energy action network so really glad to be here with you all for this workshop on transforming transportation maximizing the short term while planning for the long term um, <clears throat> i think we are well aware that transportation in the beautiful rural state of vermont accounts for 40 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions that we collectively combust in vermont so transforming this sector in a way that reduces emissions in line with what the science and the scientists say is fundamentally uh, absolutely essential um, is going to be really important and challenging. Thankfully, we have tools in our toolbox, and you're going to hear about many of those tools shortly from members of our great panel. Um, but so transforming the transportation sector um, in the short term is going to look a lot like electrifying as much as possible and moving more Vermonters um, into cleaner, um, more cost effective vehicles and moving them out of their vehicles too, both in the short term and setting the stage for over the long term for helping Vermonters, um, you know, have options beyond a vehicle to get where they need to go, making sure that they can access those um, those solutions and that those multimodal opportunities are available and affordable and work for everyone. And so that's a big piece of the work that we've all been doing. It's a conversation that we're going to have today, and it's gonna be a big piece of the work that we um, will be collaborating on into the future. So yeah, so we're gonna hear momentarily from Dave Roberts at Drive Electric Vermont, who's gonna give an overview of the state of the state when it comes to uh, cleaner vehicles and the electric vehicle sector transformation underway. Um, Dave uh, leads Drive Electric, and he's going to talk about the EV electric vehicle incentives, electric vehicle charging opportunities, sort of multifamily and workplace charging programs, and really important programs like Replace Your Ride Mileage Smart. So I think Dave is a wealth of information, and he's going to really sort of ground us in sort of the really important short-term pollution reduction opportunities to move Vermonters into more cost-effective clean vehicles. Um, then we're going to hear from Katie Gallagher, who's the Sustainable Communities Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Katie is also the coordinator of <clears throat> Transportation for Vermonters, which is a broad coalition of a variety of different organizations looking to maximize, you know, moving people, not just vehicles, and diversifying and um, our transportation system to serve everyone, while at the same time making sure it's a clean transportation system. So. Katie's going to speak to the options to move people where they need to go and the kinds of programs and strategies we need to deploy, including smart land use practices and complete streets programs to really set the stage for longer term options and a more multimodal clean uh, uh, transportation system. After that, we're going to have um, Randy Schoonmaker from Southeast Vermont Transit talk about the work that they are doing through the mover. Um, and the microtransit pilot program that they're undertaking down in Southern Vermont. And their work to you know, have this innovative pilot program serve an important niche um, in our transportation system and really bring more Vermonters, you know, underserved, often underserved Vermonters to get where they need to go. Um, it's a really exciting, innovative model. It's new, and we're very much looking forward to hearing about that. Um, after we hear from our presenters, we're going to spend time hearing from you all, and we're going to do a question and answer. So to the degree that you have questions um, for our presenters, please do drop them in the chat. 
We're gonna capture them and we're gonna to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and we're gonna follow up with resources after the, after the workshop so that we're connecting you to these incredible partners and to the programs that they're highlighting and the resources that you might need um, to support transforming our transportation system. So thank you for all modeling really great things by putting your name and location and your affiliation in the chat. Um, and it is my pleasure now to start <clears throat> by introducing Dave Roberts, the head of Drive Electric Vermont. And just quick side note, um, I know Dave has to leave us a little bit early today. So to the degree you have questions um, for Dave, um, we'll aim to get to as many of those in the Q&A as possible and follow up with the resources that um, Dave is gonna speak to a little bit. So um, again, as we move to electrify more as our climate action plan points to in the short term, move people into more cost-effective, higher mileage vehicles in an equitable way, um, Dave's going to speak to the opportunities that he sees in that arena, and then we'll dig even further in. So, Dave, welcome. And All right. Hearing you. Yeah. Thanks, Joanna, and thanks everybody for joining. Got some things to talk about related to transportation electrification in Vermont today. So, uh, I'll run through a presentation. I'm going to have to burn through a few of these slides pretty quickly, but I understand the PDF of this will be available to everybody who's signed up. So don't worry about taking notes. You will be able to get a PDF of this and always happy to, to follow up um, as needed if uh, we don't get to all your questions today. So a little bit about Drive Electric Vermont. It's a public-private partnership established about 10 years ago between VIC, which is a nonprofit. We're based in Winooski and the state of Vermont. BIC also operates Efficiency Vermont, and we're doing a lot of things related to transportation electrification in the state. We've got a website that's full of some great resources I'll, I'll provide a little more information on. But basically, you know, big picture, why go electric? Uh, obviously, emission reductions is a big part of the policy context for transportation electrification. But People who have made the switch find that uh, EVs are actually a lot of fun to drive. They have great performance, uh, the quiet rides, you can listen to music. It's just a more pleasant uh, way to get around compared to gasoline vehicle. And uh, there's significant savings potential in terms of looking at the operating costs of so reduced costs for fuel and maintenance. So go into a little bit more detail on all of these things in, in the talk here today. So this is a chart looking at some of the emission reduction pathways that the state has looked at. This is from the Energy Action Network's annual report, which pulled from uh, some supplemental work that the uh, Climate Action Plan dug into or the emission reduction pathways. And basically to meet some of the Global Warming Solutions Act goals, uh, you know, it's going to require action on many fronts, uh, not just transportation. And even within transportation, EVs uh, have an important role to play, but as does uh, additional transportation efficiency improvements. So I'm glad to be sharing the stage with uh, Katie and Randy today, who will be providing more information on that aspect of things. But uh, getting to 126,000 EVs by 2030 is a pretty tall order. We've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,500, 8,000 in the state right now to give you a ballpark idea of uh, the, the, the work ahead. And in terms of emission reductions, uh, certainly reducing vehicle travel is the best way to, to reduce emissions. Uh, but there are uh, questions about, you know, what's the real life cycle benefit of switching to an EV when you factor in the upstream emissions from electric generation and where the batteries are produced and made. And this is a study from the International Council on Clean Transportation, which is looking at sort of U.S. life cycle emission reductions of electric vehicles. And uh, basically just showing that all, all electric vehicles are sometimes called battery electric vehicles can reduce emissions by 60, 80% over the life cycle, uh, even factoring in some of those other considerations. So, uh, you know, obviously we'd like to see higher emission reductions and as our grid con continues to decarbonize and get more renewable, that will uh, essentially benefit the, the sort of long upstream tailpipe that EVs have. In terms of uh, cost savings, so I mentioned operating cost savings, uh, electric rates in Vermont are regulated. So um, 
it's it's you can see the green line here is the average uh, home electric rate for Vermonters over time. And while it does go up, and we are seeing some rate increases uh, in the you know recent past or or pending before the Public Utility Commission, it's still uh, uh, you know the case that even on that average electric rate, you're still doing much better than paying for gasoline, especially with some of the supply chain and, and other issues that are happening in the global economy that increase prices. Gasoline prices come down a little bit, but um, still potential uh, for several thousand dollars in savings over the, the ownership of an electric vehicle. And those savings can be even higher if you're able to access an off-peak electric rate through your utility, which a number of them are, are offering in Vermont. We've got some resources on the Drive Electric Vermont website. This is one of them. It's uh, We call it the, the Vehicle Comparison Tool or Model Explorer, and you can filter to show different types of vehicles. You can uh, look at which vehicles have all-wheel drive, which is a very popular thing that a lot of Vermonters look for, especially this time of year. And we are seeing some better availability of all-wheel drive models uh, than we've seen in years past. So Subaru, Solterra, all electric vehicles just starting to hit Vermont. Uh, it is a, still uh, a, an issue. Some of the supply chain uh, shortages that happened in COVID and are continuing uh, affect automakers in particular. There's a microchip shortage that is, uh, you know, definitely reducing availability of all vehicles, not just electric vehicles, but they're sharing some of the impact there. So hopefully, some of the supply chain issues will be continuing to improve, but uh, if you're in the market for a vehicle, you may need to be prepared to look around at some different models, maybe look a little further afield at dealers uh, further away from where you live, maybe even out of state, um, if you are, are in need of a vehicle in the near future. There are um, a number of incentives. So EVs tend to cost a little bit more upfront uh, than a comparable gasoline vehicle. Depends on the vehicle and, and what you're comparing it to. Uh, but uh, in, in understanding of, of that potential barrier for a lot of folks, there are a variety of incentives that have been put in place to bring down that upfront cost to make it a lot easier to purchase an EV. This is an example just looking at a new uh, Nissan LEAF. There are incentives for used EVs I'll talk a little bit more about. But for a new Nissan LEAF, uh, starting price, 32400 for the longer range LEAF Plus. Uh, it is still eligible for federal tax credit, um, which is 7500 on the LEAF. Uh, the tax credit may not be as available to somebody who's lower income. So that's the second column is uh, estimating incentives for a household that's maybe less than 50000 income. Um, there are state incentives, 2,500 for an all electric vehicle is the standard incentive. 4,000 is the higher incentive for lower income. There's a new replace your ride incentive if somebody has a 10 year old or older vehicle uh, that they can trade in to scrap and replace. It's sort of a cash for clunkers program that can be put toward an electric vehicle or a other clean mobility option. And then there are uh, electric utility incentives, which vary depending on your utility, but on average might be about 1500 for a standard incentive and another thousand for a lower income uh, customer of a utility. So when you stack all these incentives together, you could see that 32,000 uh, starting price comes down to about 21,000 for sort of standard incentive and uh, 15,400 for a lower income household. So really significant reductions in the, the purchase price make it a lot more affordable to own an EV. So on the federal side, the Inflation Reduction Act <clears throat> brought a lot of changes to a bunch of different federal incentive programs. I'm gonna focus on electric vehicles, uh, but there's a lot of other potential incentives that are included in that bill. Uh, there's a handy calculator that Rewiring America has put together. It's got a long list of all the different uh, incentives that may be out there, some of which may not be available until 2023 or maybe even beyond. Uh, but uh, that's a, an interesting tool if you're thinking about sort of broader efficiency improvements and electrification. Um, that's a, a great place to, to kind of get a start of what you might be looking at. 
On the EV side, <clears throat> the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act meant uh, that only vehicles with final assembly in North America are currently eligible for a federal tax credit. And this slide has a, a list of those vehicles that are currently, uh, plug-in electric vehicles are currently manufactured in North America. Uh, starting in January though, January 1, so a couple weeks from now, there are a number of additional requirements that ramp up beyond just having the vehicle assembled in North America. So the two key ingredients then are uh, where the battery components are, are coming from, and that will be worth uh, half of that 7,500, 3,750. And then uh, the other half is where the minerals are coming from that are being used in the, the battery or other components in the electric vehicle. And we are still waiting on some of the IRS guidance on exactly how automakers will be able to determine if they're meeting these requirements. And those requirements are gonna get more stringent over the next 10 years of uh, the availability of this. It, so at this point, we actually don't know which, if any EVs will be eligible for tax credits in 2023. We think that at least some of them will be eligible for at least uh, a 3,750 based on where batteries are being manufactured, but the minerals uh, are still kind of a wild card unknown. There's also additional uh, price caps on the tax credit that are new and income caps. So a lot to think about. Um, we've got a lot of additional information on the Drive Electric website link here on this slide. Encourage folks to check that out if they're in the market. Uh, one good thing is that there will be a new used EV tax credit uh, available in 2023. There are some additional requirements, but it's up to $4,000. Uh, so that could be a, a, a nice benefit because this uh, ha, there has not been a federal incentive for used EVs previously. Some things to keep in mind on the tax credit. Uh, it is something that the purchaser has to claim on their income tax unless they're leasing. Uh, there is a new component uh, that will allow auto dealers to pass through the tax credit at the point of sale starting in January, 2024. So we're still a, more than a year out from having that. So it means you have to have enough tax liability to get the full benefit. So if your vehicle that you're purchasing is eligible for a $7,500 tax credit, you need to have that much tax liability in the year that you uh, purchase the vehicle to get the full benefit. This is just a slide showing uh, how the mineral and battery production requirements are gonna be ramping up over the next 10 years. So even the 2023 requirements are fairly ambitious, um, but you know, obviously, by uh, 2029, when things sort of even out, um, you know, that will mean uh, hopefully a boon for some of the domestic production of, of EV components and materials. There's also the Inflation Reduction Act also includes a commercial vehicle credit. So businesses, municipalities may be eligible uh, for $7,500 for sort of lightweight, light duty vehicles and up to $40,000 for some of the medium heavy duty uh, electric vehicles that are out there. And uh, there is a provision that should allow tax exempt entities like municipalities to qualify for a direct payment, uh, which normally, you know, they wouldn't be eligible for a tax credit because they don't pay taxes. But with these direct payments, hopefully that um, won't be the case. Although we are still waiting for IRS guidance on exactly how uh, that's gonna work for municipalities or other tax exempt organizations. Inflation Reduction Act also includes an EV charging tax credit. This has been around for a number of years, extended and expiring at various times, but it extended through the end of 2022 under this sort of old system. And starting in 2023, there's some additional requirements related to uh, must be in a rural area or in a lower income area to be eligible for the credit. It does include bi-directional charging equipment. So folks who may be looking at uh, like a Ford F-150 Lightning that has a backup home backup power capability, that Lightning will be able to, um, it, the charging equipment that you're installing to, to enable that could be eligible for uh, uh, some of the tax credit as well. And businesses, municipalities included. 
A little bit more on the state of Vermont <clears throat> EV incentive amount. So it varies from $1,500 to $4,000, depending on the type of vehicle and uh, income. So this is just a quick snapshot so showing uh, for the new EV program, how that varies. Uh, there is also the used high efficiency vehicle mileage smart program that's administered by Capstone. And that offers pre-qualified income eligible customers up to thirty up to five thousand dollars or thirty percent of the purchase price uh, toward a, a used high efficiency vehicle, which includes uh, EV options. So that's a great option if you're in the market for used EV used EV and meet the income requirements. I mentioned the replace your ride program. So this is three thousand dollars for a ten year old or older vehicle. Uh, there are income requirements and a number of requirements around uh, the vehicle that's being uh, scrapped or replaced. And uh, there is a new component to that uh, that allows someone to just turn in the vehicle and get a prepaid $3,000 prepaid card that can be used for like a bike purchase, e-bike, a regular bike purchase, or other bike equipment, uh, as well as additional clean and shared mobility services. So. Uh, more information on all these incentives on the Drive Electric Vermont website. And then uh, also the utility incentive programs. Basically, almost every utility in state has an offer, and we've got uh, details on the Drive Electric Vermont website, and I uh, encourage you to uh, check out your utilities website directly as well, which we link to from Drive Electric for more details on their programs or if you have any questions. So to try to make sense out of all these things, we have an incentive calculator on the Drive Electric Vermont website that uh, estimates based on your income, the type of vehicle you're looking at, uh, what you might qualify for, for all the various incentives. It is current on the federal tax credit uh, through the end of this calendar year. So for the next few weeks, as of January 1, we'll be updating the tool to reflect the, the current eligibility as best we know moving forward. Um, based on IRS guidance, but it's likely that uh, since we haven't seen IRS guidance on the Inflation Reduction Act changes coming in 2023, there may be a lag, but you know, potentially well into 2023 before we really know which vehicles will be eligible for federal tax credit. Hopefully they'll get that straightened out as soon as possible. Also wanted to just talk briefly about some of the charging equipment opportunities that are out there. Um, and for folks who maybe aren't aware, there's three types of charging. Uh, level one charging plugs into a standard home outlet. About half of Vermonters that we've surveyed are, are just kind of getting by with level one charging. That includes plug-in hybrid drivers uh, who can run on electricity for maybe up to 40 miles, and then they have gasoline engine as sort of a backup for longer distance travel. So the batteries aren't as big, and uh, level one charging can work fine for those overnight. But for all electric vehicles or people who are trying to access their utility off peak electric rates, typically you step up to a level two charger, which is 240 volt, like a electric clothes dryer at home. It typically gives about 10 to 20 miles of range per hour of charging. And then we have DC fast charging, which is much higher powered, much faster charging, much more expensive to install and, and operate and maintain. Uh, so historically, we haven't seen a, a ton of fast charging in the state, but that is changing. Uh, the state has invested uh, several million dollars in charging infrastructure over the past few years. Uh, recent focus is on fast charging and supporting folks in multifamily locations. Uh, the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development has contracts to build out 17 locations. And I've circled the two that are actually in the ground, uh, South Hero, Newport, or Derby, and additional locations, hopefully um, opening up soon. Um, each of these will have at least two fast chargers, so some additional redundancy. And uh, ACCD is currently developing a funding opportunity for another $7 million in state funds for multifamily workplace and public attraction EV charging. And there's a link here that uh, will take you to more information on some of the ACCD resources. Happy to answer questions and uh, provide more information on that if, if people are interested. And then in addition to those state funded chargers, there is a significant amount of federal funding that's going into charging infrastructure. 
the federal infrastructure bill, the investment infrastructure investment and jobs act uh, passed a little over a year ago is bringing about $20 million to Vermont for uh, fast charging along uh, designated corridors that are highlighted on this map. And that will require a minimum of at least four 150 kW uh, fast chargers every 50 miles along these corridors. And that's basically just a faster fast charging technology for those who aren't aren't familiar. That's um, you know a better fit for some of the newer EVs that can can handle that higher power level. So uh, Vermont developed a plan. Uh, VTrans led the development of that. It was approved by the feds uh, in September. Uh, still waiting on some of the federal requirements on how those funds can be used, and then VTrans will be uh, moving forward with um, sort of potentially upgrading some of the funds, some of the sites that uh, have been funded through uh, the ACCD program, maybe adding some additional sites at the locations flagged on this map. So um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to stop there, but uh, hopefully you got the flavor that there's a lot going on with Inflation Reduction Act incentives. Uh, so there's a lot of potential, but also some uncertainties, and hopefully we'll know more uh, you know, in the next month or so, we'll certainly be updating Drive Electric Vermont resources as soon as we have better information to share on that front. And, you know, thanks to all of you for the work you're doing in your communities. There's uh, things that are ha happening already in terms of municipal fleets. Uh, many municipalities have supported charging installations in their communities and just helping raise awareness through events and other activities. So uh, I encourage you to let us know if we can do anything to help in those efforts. Thank you so much, Dave. It was really helpful presentation, wealth of information, lots of new and important programs um, stood up by, helped to be stood up by many people on this call. And that is really important and exciting. So thank you so much. Um, Hope you can stick around for the Q&A for as long as you're um, able. And, and also just important to note before I turn it over to my fantastic colleague, Katie Gallagher, that you spoke to. I mean, there's a lot of work underway, new incentive programs, expanded incentive programs, and there's a lot more work to do. Um, there are two planning efforts, and maybe Katie's going to speak to a, one or both of these underway at VTrans. The carbon reduction um, strategy underway at VTrans as required by the Inflation Reduction Act to look at how to optimize existing um, investments through the v, that VTrans makes in our transportation system through the lens of greenhouse gas emission reductions um, and other important benefits we're trying to deliver, including accessibility and affordability and um, equity outcomes. Um, and then the vehicle miles traveled um, analysis that's underway at VTrans. And Katie, are you gonna speak to that at all? I wasn't going to just for the sake of time, but happy to to bring it up or talk more about it in the Q&A time. That'd be great. If you wanted to flag it, I think it's really important because as Katie's going to um, speak to us um, right now, um, electrifying a lot, helping reduce, um, you know, the carbon intensity of the fuels that we use in our vehicles to get where we need to go is a critical short term climate strategy and accessibility, job access and other um, strategy. And at the same time, Moving people is fundamentally what we need to do. That means moving all people, and that means creating a multimodal system over time in a rural state that works for everyone and is cost effective and equitable. So this is really important, big piece of work. So Katie um, <clears throat> is going to talk about the work that she is leading with a variety of different program uh, partners and to think about transportation demand management strategies um, and how do we um, set us up for long-term transportation system transformation. So Take it away, Katie, and please keep dropping your questions in the chat. We're going to aim to get to as many of them as possible after our speakers. Thanks. Thank you, Joey. And thank you all for being here and talking about one of my favorite topics. And I'm going to um, speed through this for time, but I could talk forever. So please drop any questions in the chat box and don't hesitate to reach out to me afterwards if you have any other um, questions. But as we, we just talked about, EVs are a really big part of how we're going to address reducing our emissions in the short term. But one of the other key strategies that's talked about in the Climate Action Plan is reducing vehicle miles traveled. This is 
the trips that we take driving alone. Um, and so, as Joey mentioned in the intro, um, my role at uh, VNRC is, is directing our sustainable communities program. And as part of that work, I also coordinate Transportation for Vermonters, which is a really diverse coalition that looks at transportation from different angles in order to um, create a rural transportation system that, that not only is um, sustainable in terms of the environment, but also is, is accessible and affordable for folks. So I just wanted to take a step back to say um, that when we reduce our dependence on personal vehicles, um, we are, are working towards a transportation system that works for everybody. So that means that folks who don't have access or reliable access to cars, um, providing greater uh, transportation options for them can help us get to work or get to better jobs, to um, access health care, to drop our kids off at school and then go to work. All of these things are, are part of the transportation system. Um, in addition to reducing our, our climate pollution and emissions, um, this is, uh, you know, not driving personal vehicles is a way that we can reduce air pollution and water pollution. Um, and then another piece here is affordability. We know we are paying more than uh, a lot of our, our counterparts in the South who don't have to deal with salt and other issues. Um, paying for cars and maintaining them is expensive. Um, and so if we have other options that are less expensive, that is huge for keeping dollars in our pocket um, and helping folks to, to uh, pay for the other needs that they have. So this is a really robust discussion, but one of the things that really excites me about uh, this topic is that it's a win-win-win. And the other thing that's not mentioned here is that um, uh, safety is a really big issue and we are able to create a better um, uh, quality of life and vibrant communities when we focus on moving people instead of, of vehicles. And so what I want to focus on today is how you and your town can um, work to make that transportation shift, both in the short term and in the long term. So before I get into that, I just painted a nice rosy picture of, of all the, you know, we can make this work for everyone, but of course we live in a place that is rural, uh, that deals with a lot of snow, uh, that was built to accommodate cars in many cases rather than people. So we face many challenges and this is not a comprehensive list, but just wanna highlight the kind of main three that I see. One is the high cost of infrastructure and maintenance. So for example, in this picture of, of Burlington, we have crosswalks, bike lanes, the flashing beacon lights, sidewalks, all of those things cost a lot of money and that's ongoing maintenance. So that's a very real challenge, especially for smaller towns. Um, the second, as you all probably know, the reason that we don't have a really robust uh, public transit system is because we lack population density, which is required for uh, different types of transportation options. But you know, I wanna think about this also, not just in the fact that we have small towns and it's difficult to connect to them, um, but also that we are lacking density within our towns because we have built our communities in particular over the past couple of decades to be built out and out and out um, for different reasons. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, but that is a big barrier to, um, to sustainable transportation. And then the third, I just wanna, uh, kind of highlight, put a plug in, just so we're thinking about the fact that a lot of our main streets that go through our, our villages and downtowns are actually owned by the state and they're maintained by the Agency of Transportation, which can be um, really good for towns and that they don't have to take on that cost of maintaining that streets. But because the state and the agency is, um, is tied by certain rules and regulations that can make it really difficult for towns um, that say want to narrow those streets or to provide bump outs or do certain things, um, you can uh, come up against certain challenges when the town doesn't own the street. So moving into shorter term solutions, we have three. And the first is um, having a good sense of who your partners are and what resources are already out there. And there's a lot 
this is, you know, by no means all of them, but just wanted to put up these kind of key five. The first is Go Vermont, which um, I'm guessing a lot of folks have already heard of, but if not, this is a really fantastic resource for commuters. Um, VTrans's bike and pedestrian program has a grant, uh, grant program, but also provides technical assistance and guidance documents. Um, and, and I wanna flag that engaging with VTrans early and often is very critical to success. A lot of transportation projects on, at the community level are going to be multi-year efforts. Uh, and so the worst thing that can happen is that you do a bunch of work uh, and you are now two, three years down the road, you've gotten everybody signed on and now VTrans is telling you that you can't do that thing. Um, they often have, have paving projects and bridge projects and things that are in the pipeline for multiple years. So again, just making sure that you are contacting um, and connecting with VTrans staff uh, at the beginning and kind of throughout any planning process is, is really important. And to help you with that planning process, on the right that uh, we have our regional planning commissions, all of our regional planning commissions have transportation planners so they can help with the planning, but they can also help um, with data collection, like collecting um, uh, traffic counts and things like that. So they can be a really helpful source um, for thinking about uh, needs and what next steps can be. And then I threw, there's again, many more partners than, than just this, but two that I wanted to highlight here. One is Local Motion nonprofit based in Burlington. They do a lot of work. One of the things they do is they provide resources and guidance for towns. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second, what that can look like, but they um, are a really great way to engage the rest of the community in this planning process. Um, and I also wanted to highlight AARP because they might not be an, an obvious partner, but because accessible transportation and, and safe streets are so critical for older Vermonters, they've been a really great partner um, in both providing funding and coordinating partners across the state and at the national level to ensure that we have the, the data and the resources that are needed um, to improve our, our transportation system and network. So my second shorter term solution is data collection. And I am a bit of a data nerd, so I, I really love diving into the data here, but I do think it's really important to have a good understanding of where, when, and how your community is moving, um, especially when we're talking about making those really significant investments like in a sidewalk or even uh, if, you want, if your community wants to put up a, a flashing beacon light, um, knowing, you know, what are the, the crosswalks that people feel um, unsafe at? What do we need to, which section of town should we prioritize? Um, how are people already moving around and through what modes? All of those questions are really critical to be able to um, prioritize action and move forward. So um, on the left here, uh, if you can see, this is a little map of my town of Waterbury, and this is from a data source uh, called On the Map. It is showing here that we have about 1,800 folks that are traveling into Waterbury to work, only about 400 people who live and work in Waterbury, and uh, again, a, a lot of people who are leaving Waterbury to work elsewhere. So those kind of commuter patterns can be really helpful to know about. Um, there's a lot of data that you can get from the census. On the map is a similar kind of uh, national level data source that can be really helpful for providing baseline data. Um, but I also want to caution that, especially for smaller towns, using um, national level data can, can be less accurate for smaller towns. Um, so moving into the middle here, you can get data from service providers. Um, this is just a snapshot of um, uh, winter bus ridership from Green Mountain Transit Service in the Mad River Valley. Um, so they're able to provide this data and we see over the past 10 years, ridership trends looks like bus ridership is declining. But then we know that and we can dig in a little bit more to why is that? What can we change? Are people um, living and getting on the bus in different areas? So on and so forth. 
There's also a lot of really great data that's collected from the Agency of Transportation and from your Regional Planning Commission. So they're a great source as well. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to highlight here, quantitative data is great. It does not tell the whole story, especially again, for your smaller communities. Um, you are not going to be able to get the kind of granular level information about um, certain streets, certain modes, how people feel most comfortable or safe, um, where they're trying to go, that really requires a deeper dive into your specific community. So having things like um, a survey to ask more specific questions um, is, I think, really important to get that more qualitative community specific information. Um, this is another fun part, engaging your community to uh, figure out what those opportunities for next steps are. And my favorite here are pop-up demonstration projects. Um, coming back to local motion, again, if you can see in the middle picture, this uh, truck thing uh, in the back is full of like tools and resources and this adorable pop-up roundabout thing. Um, they provide low or no cost uh, uh, tools for communities to implement on a short term basis. So whether it's if you wanna paint a temporary crosswalk or sidewalk, um, do a temporary bump out with plantings, um, you could do any of these things with these tools and engage the community, get their feedback, get them to visualize what these changes can look like, can feel like. Um, and this is a great way not only to get people excited about these potential changes, um, but also to get folks like your select board um, on the same page about how this can improve uh, a feeling of safety um, and encourage people to get out and walk and bike in this specific instance. Um, and can also help when you are then later on in the process going to apply for a grant or you're trying to get the town to invest in certain infrastructure. Um, the second uh, piece I wanted to flag here, uh, this is a program called Walk to Shop, which is led by Net Zero Vermont. Um, and just wanted to use this as an example of one of like a, a relatively simple problem, which would be you live within walking distance to a grocery store, but you don't walk to the grocery store because I can't carry all of my groceries back and forth. So the relatively simple solution is a, is a rolling trolley that you can use to put your groceries in so that you can actually walk back and forth to the grocery store. Um, so if you think again, if you wanna uh, purchase some of these, table in front of your grocery store for a couple of days, start that conversation with community members and, and start to think about what are some of those, those um, lower hanging fruit things that we can address in the shorter term. And then I also just wanted to flag Safe Routes to School as another really fantastic opportunity to engage with the community, with families, with your school, um, and to get people out. Um, in a structured way that, you know, these are our existing kind of um, resources that aren't that difficult to plug into, um, but can make a really big difference in your community to both get people out and moving, but also to think again about how our transportation is, is structured and how it might change. So moving into longer term solutions, um, the first I want to talk about is is zoning. Um, and so, you know, obviously this is a little bit more of a of a planning commission responsibility, but there is certainly room for energy committees and others to engage with planning commissions on how we uh, think about municipal regulations and how we can further smart growth uh, land use planning. So um, this is a map I pulled from a New York Times article that came out like two days ago and is really fantastic, but it's looking at uh, emissions at the neighborhood level. So if you can see here on the left, we have Burlington on the right, uh, St. J. And what it's showing is that denser communities have lower emissions. 
And this is not just related to transportation. This is also true for these other categories that you can see on the screen here. Um, but transportation is certainly a really big piece of it. So I just thought that this was a really fantastic kind of visualization of that. But the way that we um, develop and land our land use planning has so much to do with our transportation and our future ability to reduce our emissions that it's really, really critical that this is part of the broader conversation. So the quote on the right here, I just included because really hit that point, which is, we need to be building smaller homes in denser places, closer together and closer to jobs and to public transportation. This doesn't mean that we're building, you know, 10 story buildings in every Vermont town, but it does mean that we are doing things like allowing duplexes in our downtowns. We're looking for opportunities for infill and smaller homes uh, in our existing villages and, and town centers. Um, so Joey had brought up that VTrans is, is currently undergoing a, a study uh, that's looking at smart growth and vehicle miles traveled to have more quantitative data around um, the relationship between smart growth. So where we have compact community centers that are, that are safe and, and walkable and have transportation options and reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we've been um, a partner in, in that work for the past couple of months and a report should be coming out in the next uh, upcoming couple of months and are really looking forward to um, what what that comes out with but what we are expecting is that it will affirm what we I think you know kind of know to be true which is that if you have the opportunity to walk bike take public transit um, you know take a scooter car share all of these things um, will help us to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from from personal vehicle transportation. A uh, second longer term solution is innovation. So I'm not gonna dig too much into this cause we're gonna hear more about it from Randy in a minute. Um, but you know, it is true, we live in a rural state. We are not going to, for example, be able to expand public transit as we currently know it to every town. It's not gonna happen, but it could expand uh, in a different form. So what might that look like? And one way is microtransit, um, but there's other types of innovative solutions that towns have been exploring and implementing throughout the state. Um, and so again, this is where it, it is helpful to better understand what your specific community needs are. Um, but this is, this is, you know, we need, we're at a time where we need to be thinking creatively about, um, things that we don't currently have and might need to invent or come up with a creative solution for moving forward. And then my final longer term solution is multimodal transportation planning. And I love this, but this planning can take the form of, um, you know, a village master plan. Maybe it's part of your climate action plan, an active transportation plan. It could be anything, but the, the goal here is to think about how you are um, planning for connectivity and a network of mobility through your town. And generally we're, we're talking primarily about an existing community center to really anchor that mobility network. Um, but how is your, um, you, you know, for example, your bike lanes connecting to a sidewalk, which might connect in this example of Hyde Park to the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail that we want to be able to have both on and off-road networks connecting to each other, um, which can also help to support your, your um, local businesses and community vibrancy. Um, all of these things are, are part and parcel. So um, I love the comprehensive planning part of this. And many towns have, have moved forward with this type of planning through the Better Connections Grant Program, which is a partnership between VTRANS, um, the Department of Health, Department of um, Housing and Community Development, and I think a couple others that I'm forgetting, sorry. Um, but there are uh, great opportunities for funding out there to do this type of work and think really comprehensively about how transportation and mobility fits into your, your broader community planning. So I'm gonna leave it there. Here's um, several resources just from this 
presentation, but there are more that we're going to be sending out um, afterwards in a, in a fuller list. Um, so uh, yeah, Joey, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Katie, for that really informative um, presentation, context, um, framework that we're going to need to fully transform our transportation system. Um, that's really exciting and really very much appreciate all of the work that you and so many others are doing in this arena and that we're going to collectively do together. Um, and we're also just, just to note that we're going to go much deeper on one important tool that Katie highlighted um, in her presentation, which is Complete Streets and the opportunity that um, program and approach offers to really, again, move people and not just vehicles um, and hot off the presses. Um, we're gonna be having a webinar with Katie and other um, experts on the Complete Streets Approach and Program at noon uh, this coming uh, January 18th, 2023. My fabulous colleague Greta has just dropped the registration for that Complete Streets webinar in the chat. So join us then and before, because we have a few more workshops um, for this virtual VCAN conference this week um, coming up at noon. Um, but please do join us, um, Katie and others, to talk about Complete Streets on January 18th. And for our last presentation, before we turn over to q and I'm really excited to have um, Randy Schoonmaker here, um, who's the CEO of Southeast Vermont Transit. Um, Randy's going to speak to their exciting new Microtron Transit pilot project, the, the Mover, which is really fun to say. Um, Windsor is one of five Vermont towns that's been given a three-year pilot program, Microtransit grant, uh, by the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Um, so that's really exciting. And so Randy's going to tell us what Microtransit is, but in general, it's an Uber-like system of real-time hailed um, dynamically rooted public transit, which is open to everyone, um, provided by a small bus or van. And it's a really exciting, potentially transformative transportation solution to help fill a niche in Vermont's current transportation system now and over time to more cost effectively and equitably ensure all Vermonters can get where they need to go, whether it's the doctor's office, the grocery store, a movie, whatever. So it's really exciting and important work. Randy, tell us what you've been up to in Southern Vermont um, and why and how it might be a model for other communities. So I'll turn it over to you, Randy, with thanks and take it away. Thank you, Johanna. Um, I wanna make sure everybody can see my screen. Yes, if you put it in, yeah, there we go, perfect, thanks. There we go, great. Thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so we have a couple of different microtransit projects either in concept or about to start. And I'll talk about Windsor first. As Johanna said, microtransit's Uber with a van and um, it's different from a taxi service. You can't hail this from the sidewalk. You need to make a reservation. There are algorithms and other planning software in mind that have to be uh, put into the plan of the vehicle each day to make sure we can deliver what we've promised. Um, but it is handicapped accessible. It's been around for several years in Vermont, and it's about to expand. Um, concepts from each of, of the seven transit providers in Vermont were proposed to VTrans a couple years ago. We did 12 feasibility studies. We're either done or working on the 12, split over two years. When the studies were complete, VTrans selected five of those. This is funded through the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Grant Program. And this particular round is unusual in that it's completely federally and state funded. Usually it's an 80%, 10%, 10% match um, requiring 10% local funds. This is not, uh, which is wonderful. And you can see the towns around the state that have qualified for these two-year pilots. And after the second round of feasibility studies, studies which are now underway, VTrans may award additional ones starting in FY24. Um, the state's fiscal year is July 1st, so that would be the end of the current fiscal year's grant application cycle and the beginning of the funding cycle for next year. Windsor will be the first pilot uh, from FY23 to start operations. We're hoping to start on January 23rd. Um, 
what are the benefits of microtransit? It fills in gaps. Um, there's an awful lot of need for public transit and not enough of it has been um, well stated before. Uh, it helps meet unmet needs. There's people who have public transit but need more of it. Um, it serves populations that are not already served by Medicaid, elderly and disabled, the VA program, um, a whole bunch of others. Um, and it addresses spontaneous travel needs. My, my car just broke down or my son stranded at school after work or my person who took, takes me back and forth to work uh, went home sick today. We'll be able to address that in this program. There are quality of life benefits. People can age at home longer. They can work from home. They have greater mobility. And it allows groups like Volunteers in Action and other volunteer companies to use their resources elsewhere. And Volunteers in Action is a volunteer group operated out of the Mount Escutney Hospital in Windsor. And they've been a key partner here on the project that we have. So it's going to be a great uh, program. It's going to nest nicely with what we can do and what they can do. And obviously, all of this results in greater equity in transportation options. The ridership markets are seniors and youth, carless households. And some people have only one car, and sometimes that car doesn't run. Sometimes two people need one car. Um, people needing transportation to jobs. Temporary needs, as we discussed a minute ago, persons with disabilities. SCVT has two projects. One is in Windsor. We completed our feasibility study this past May, and we're starting a, a pilot program, as we mentioned, in January. And in Brattleboro, we're uh, about halfway through the feasibility study there. We just went public with the announcement of that, and we're getting lots of public input which is wonderful. And that study should be complete in March, just in time for the grant application cycle for next year's operation funding. The Windsor Project is sponsored by VTrans and Mount Escutney Hospital, two great partners to work with in this case. We did a study in, in Springfield and we did a study in Windsor and Windsor was chosen because there was just no existing public transit routes there at all. Virtually every town in Vermont has some public transit. You may not see a fixed route bus, but there are volunteer cars. There are vans transporting people to appointments. There are other types of transportation that are, are available. But in Windsor, there was a lot of need and there wasn't any fixed route uh, in particular. One vehicle will cover the project, making it less expensive. Some of the studies we've done and seen require two or three vehicles, and obviously that doubles or triples the cost of the project. And in Windsor, there was strong advocacy by Mount Escutney Hospital. They really didn't give us a choice. They were so strong and so good. And um, we, just, we just had to make sure this happened. And it just seemed like the right size town for microtransit. One of the things that really popped up for Windsor was they have a hospital in Windsor. They have shopping in Windsor. They have social services in Windsor. They have congregate meals. They have congregate housing in Windsor um, with nothing to serve all that. And it was all under the auspices of one town. So it really was a great project. And I think the hospital is gonna drive the demand for quite a few rides. Um, $120,000 of federal funding, $30,000 of state funding. That's for just part of this fiscal year. Not sure what a whole year is going to cost, but this is our budget for the existing year. The project's organized that, that we're responsible for the grant. We applied for it, we have to administer it and be responsible for it. We built a core team that steers the project, stakeholder group, and then the public provides key input. And a lot of this was modeled on Montpelier's public outreach program. I think they did a great job at the beginning of the program, getting everybody together and soliciting input. Um, our core team meets at least once a month. We were meeting weekly when the pro program started, but the stakeholder group really advocated well for all their clients and gave us a whole nother level of information. And then we've had a series of public meetings and mailings and all kinds of stuff. And um, we've gotten a lot of good public input. I mentioned public input is key. Uh, we've had two sets of public meetings. We'll, we'll have one more in early January, just before the program starts. 
community bulletin boards. One of our core team members walks through Windsor and hits every bulletin board there is. Um, our website, obviously, and social media. We've done surveys, um, paper, online, um, and over the phone. We've talked to riders, non-riders, businesses, social service agencies, the local taxi company, the town. Um, we've done a lot of survey work. We've uh, published our efforts and our results on newspaper, radio, local and regional television. We've done, we're gonna be doing a mailing to every taxpayer in Windsor with a copy of this micro transit brochure that we've already developed. It'll go out in early January, just before we go live. So everybody in town that we can reach through the mailbox will get a copy of our brochure. I mentioned we've had a bunch of one-on-one -on -one meetings with key stakeholders. And we really have a strong core team leadership. Um, different people bring different things to the table, as you can imagine. And some people on our core team ran housing. And they took our surveys door to door and made sure that everybody filled one out and returned it. We had almost 100% response in those properties by the property manager, which was, which was just wonderful. We could have never penetrated that on our own. Uh, Mount Escutney Hospital and in Brattleboro, the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation has done a phenomenal job with a uh, employer survey that we worked on together. How will this work in Windsor? Um, it's going to operate from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. And we think it's going to be a maximum of 30 minutes from the time you call until the time we can pick you up. We're shooting for 15, but we're, we're publicizing 30. Uh, curb, to serve, curb to curb service or a short walk to the next bus stop. Um, we'll try to be right at your door whenever you call, but in some cases, there might not be a safe place to pull over or we'll ask people to take a short walk to meet us. Uh, just like any other public transit vehicle, uh, you'll be sharing the ride with other people. It is fare free. There is no cost for the service. It's within the town of Windsor boundaries and uh, a section of Route 5 up to Exit 9 park and ride on Route 91. We've had a little bit of pushback on the town boundary concept because people just over the town boundaries have really good reasons and concerns why they should have it too, but we have to put a border on this thing. We have to be able to define a concrete area for us to work on and for us to be able to deliver the service to the people that we've promised it to. And over time, if we find that we can take on more capacity or a larger area, we certainly will. But for the time being, we're gonna start to make sure we can chew everything that we've um, that we chewed off. There's one lift equipped vehicle. It will be trips reserved and can be done by an app, calling the office or booking online. We will not stop and pick somebody up along the route. This goes back to the algorithms I mentioned earlier where the software that we're using to program all these rides does not accommodate people stepping on board the bus and saying, can you go here or can you go there? So similar to what is done in Montpelier, we're going to make this that you need to make a reservation and we're going to make it as easy as possible. We don't care how they book a ride. We're not going to steer them towards using the app or calling the office. It's whatever they're comfortable with. The map of Windsor is on the left. That is our, our boundary. That is a rough guide as to where we'll be servicing it. And when you go on Google Maps and on the app, you'll see the map on the right highlighting the area that we serve. And of course you can zoom in on that and see if your house or your street is on that program. Our calendar, we started last September with public meetings and then we went into the survey phase starting in the middle of September. We hope to have another second round of meetings as I mentioned in early January. We've been marketing the new system, but we'll do the mailing of the brochure, the website, the social media, more TV, radio, newspaper, uh, bulletin board, everything. We'll have a real uh, blanket approach starting in, right after the first of the year. We will um, field test for a week and then we hope to go live on the 23rd of January. There'll be no sleep in our company the night before, I can, I can promise you. 
we have a, this little seven passenger van that we're expecting any day now. This is a Ford Transit. It's got uh, a transit bus type door and higher roof. It will seat seven people. It'll hold two wheelchairs. If both wheelchairs are occupied, it'll only seat three people. It's got all wheel drive. We'll put studded snow tires on it. And this will go um, no matter what the weather is. So if you get a really snowy day and you have a reservation, we will be there. Uh, we don't close down because of the weather. Um, but this is a nice vehicle. We find if it's not big enough, we have a 14 seat bus that we can run as well. And I mentioned the micro moo and the little logo that we have there with a cow driving the bus. Um, we're getting a lot of giggles about that, which is good. Our second project is a feasibility study in Brattleboro. Brattleboro's got really good public transit, um, especially for the size of the town, and it's very well supported, always has been for a long period of time. There are three lines of public transit, the red, white, and blue lines, and they all meet downtown at the transportation center uh, each hour, so you can always get around town, especially now that it's fare free. Um, our ridership has spiked, and we're one of the few routes in the state that has higher ridership now than we did before the pandemic. In 2019, a lot of transit companies, including our own, had record years in ridership. And on these particular routes, we are beyond that record, um, which speaks very well to the support we have from that community. They told us what they expect and what they like and what they needed back in 2018 when we restudied the routes and redid them. And um, they were right on. We did what they asked, and it's been great ever since. The unmet needs in Brattleboro, as we see them, are second and third shift employees. I mentioned that we did um, a transportation study with the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. What, what a great partner they have been. They used the survey that we had designed up in Springfield, and they sent it out to all the employers they work with. Very detailed information, great follow-up long conversations with them about tell me who it is, where they are, what they're doing and what you're doing. Um, so we've got some great data to give to the consulting company as far as what those needs are. And we quickly found that second shift was, was by far the biggest demand. We have, we have welcomed over a hundred Afghan refugees since early January of this past year. And, and most of them are still carless or licensed, don't have a license, although that's changing but they all wanna work and they all wanna work hard and the community has welcomed them and employers have welcomed them. They don't all live on the bus route. And so they need their own type of transportation. Uh, the BDCC hired a van and ran a van pool for eight months. Uh, that funding is running out and I'm not sure what the future of that program is, but it was a great model. And I think that's a third shift model for a future year. And of course, there's students, uh, athletics theater, there's a circus training program in town. There's all kinds of activities for the kids to do. People getting home after five o'clock. Our biggest complaint is when we stop at 5.30, people would love to have one more loop. Um, and that sounds easy to do, but it's difficult to fund. Um, so that's a, a key time of day where we could really make a, an impact on people's lives. And there's dining and hospital discharging and, and all kinds of cultural and municipal functions that people would, would go to if such a service was available. Our scope, as we're thinking about it here, is 5 to 11.30 at night. So this is totally different than Windsor and Montpelier, and it complements the fixed route, as I mentioned before. Again, it would be geographically limited to the Brattleboro town limits. Walmart is two miles over the New Hampshire border, and we're not sure about that, but we're going to start it off by studying just within the Brattleboro town limits. We'll do one vehicle again, uh, same type of vehicle. And if it's funded, we might start in September or October after more public input. We're already doing public input now. We're doing surveys. We're doing the usual things that we did in Windsor, plus a whole nother level with BDCC on the employer needs. So we're gonna have that all together, all in the can when we go to apply for this thing. And if we are funded, we'll be ready to just pretty much go uh, versus Windsor when we got funded and then we went out and, and solicited the input. 
How can I get involved? I have a map here of the transit provider territories in Vermont. There are seven of us, um, mostly on county lines, but not always. We belong to a, an organization called the Vermont Public Transportation Association. They've got a great website and a lot of resources. VTrans is our funding partner. They funnel both state and federal funds of all kinds to us. We are all subrecipients. They are wonderful partners. We each have a coordinator. Each of the seven of us have coordinators. We share coordinators and the response and the support is just, just awesome. And I have to put a plug in um, for being a community driver. I mentioned volunteer drivers. The, the new term for that is community drivers. Vermont has a huge volunteer program, but it's not nearly as huge as it was before the pandemic. And those drivers are awarded or reimbursed right now 62 and a half cents a mile for every mile that they travel. And it's all medical appointments and it's all people going to the doctors, the pharmacy, opioid treatment. We also do congregate meals, uh, adult daycare, things of that nature for both Medicaid clients and elderly and disabled. And it's a wonderful program. Although we have metallic signs on the sides of our volunteer cars, you really in your community won't know you're passing a volunteer driver at all because you'll just, they're just blend in. They're providing a wonderful service we are very short of drivers. If you have any inclination at all to become involved in your community, um, this is a great opportunity. Contact your local public transit provider. We have volunteer drivers that make almost six figures. They drive every day and they go all over. And you can say, I only want to drive Mondays or, or afternoons, or I don't want this, or I don't want that. And I, I can speak for our company. We'll take whatever we can get from you in terms of your time. So um, please consider that. And I don't think I have to, to ask this group to advocate for public transit because I sense it through the speakers and the people who are attending here today. So please continue that support. And I think, Joe, that is it. That's great. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, and thank you so much to each of our speakers, our presenters for your you're being with us here today, lending your insights, your expertise, um, the resources, and more so for what you're doing every day. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions in the chat, and I am going to um, actually trying to get to as many of them as possible. So I wonder, Randy, if you don't mind stopping screen sharing, there you go. Um, and then, yeah, let's get to as many questions as possible. Um, so starting <clears throat> at the top, especially because I know Dave Roberts is a little bit time limited, keep your questions coming. We're gonna try to get to as many, but harkening back to the free, first presentation, leaning on Dave Roberts, um, a question from Sarah Bruce of the Heartland Energy Committee. I was at a Subaru dealer yesterday and was told that the 2023 Crosstrek um, PHEV is not eligible for the federal incentive because of new requirements in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, is this correct? What about other incentives? And Dave, to the degree you're able to speak to some of the challenges about electric vehicles in the Inflation Reduction Act, if you may. Yeah, Thank you. so unfortunately that is correct. Uh, Subaru's EV options are not uh, assembled in North America, so effective on passage of the bill back in August, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, vehicles with assembly outside North America are no longer eligible. So that means the Crosstrek plug-in hybrid as well as the Solterra are not eligible. It's possible at some point in the future, a number of automakers that currently manufacture outside North America are looking at bringing more production to the US, so Hyundai, Kia, looking at factories in the South. Um, so potentially in the next several years, Subaru does have some manufacturing in the US, just not for their EVs. So it's possible they could uh, follow suit and do something like that. But at least for the near term, uh, it won't be eligible for a federal tax credit. Uh, it is still eligible for state and utility incentives though. Uh, so those are still out there. And if you happen to find one used, 
uh, starting in January. And if you found one used for under $25,000 and you met the income eligibility requirements, you could potentially get that federal tax credit for used purchase because that doesn't have the same manufacturing and, and sourcing requirements that are in place for new vehicles. Great, thanks, Dave. And um, just keeping putting you on the spot for a moment before I put our couple of our other speakers on the spot. Um, and I, this relates to EV charging. I'm going to smush two questions together, smurge, as I've learned from Representative Laura Sibelia. Two things. Is there an issue with providing enough electricity supply to all the new chargers? And I've heard that new charge stations will soon include battery storage to even out the load. Are any of those coming to Vermont? So do we have the supply? And related to storage, is any of the um, battery charging coming to Vermont? Yep. So in terms of supply, uh, Velco does a long range plan for the state that looks at statewide, you know, what the needs are for electricity and, you know, what infrastructure is in place to meet those needs. Uh, their most recent plan looked at a pretty ambitious EV forecast and found, you know, for the most part, uh, the infrastructure would be able to handle it. Uh, there may be some upgrades for liability or other issues. It's sort of the normal uh, cost of doing business for, for utilities. Uh, there have been some issues with more localized issue. Um, some of the more rural co-ops in particular, uh, their transformers that serve homes are smaller than what you might see in more urban communities. And so some of those transformers may need to be upgraded, especially if you had you know, multiple level two chargers in the same area. So it's it's sort of a mix. I mean, in general, utilities should be able to, to meet the needs, especially if folks are taking advantage of some of those off-peak charging programs, which, um, you know, a lot of folks are doing. Uh, so it's something to keep an eye on, but it's certainly not anything like a, a critical issue at this point. In terms of the battery storage, uh, we haven't seen that in Vermont yet. Uh, some of that is being driven not just by reliability issues, but also just by utility rate structures. Um, and a lot of the utilities in Vermont have essentially better rate structures for, for especially the fast charging equipment than what you might find in other states. So moving forward, it probably will start to see some of that uh, in the, 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 the next couple of years, especially there are some technologies that might be suitable in areas uh, where, for example, a, a gas station that wants to add EV charging that doesn't have a really high power connection to the grid, rather than paying for grid upgrades, they might uh, take advantage of one of these battery storage integrated chargers, but we haven't seen it yet, at least not to my knowledge. Thank you so much, Dave. Take you off the hot seat for just a minute. Ideally get back there before we have to go, but um, question maybe for you, Katie, although if others have information, please weigh in. Do sample transportation surveys exist with the understanding that each town is unique? And maybe that's also a question for the RPCs, but Katie or others, do you have an answer to that question? Um, I will share what I know, but I'd love to hear from others as well. Um, I don't, I, the, actually, the survey that I shared, I think, was a sample survey, but was from VTrans, so a little bit higher level than um, what what a town would be wanting to implement to get kind of at that more granular level of, of information. Um, there are, I would suggest, you know, definitely looking at existing surveys that have been put out. So for example, if you go through and I can put it in the in the chat, but in the Better Connections grant program page, they have all of the previous projects that have been awarded. Um, and some of those have done community surveys um, that you can you know borrow from that language. Um, but I, I don't know of any um, kind of town level sample surveys, but that's a great question that I would I would love to to know the answer to, if there is any that exist. Well, I think I just dropped in the chat that the Regional Planning Commissions of Vermont um, would be a great partner and a potential um, resource to ask that really important question. And I dropped a link to our 11 RPCs in the chat. So I encourage you to follow up and see if that is something they can help with. Um, question, another question. Um, well, question for Randy. Randy, um, 
Did you ever consider having a bike rack on the mover vans? We sure have. Um, bike racks are a hot topic these days in transit. We've had bike racks on all of our buses for ages, but with the advent of electric bikes and fat tires on a number of different bikes, we found that the racks that you could either buy from a standard manufacturer like Sportworks or that you make like ours don't accommodate every type of bike. So uh, Sportworks has just come out with a new model that we've just ordered one for that we're gonna test this winter in Brattleboro. And if so, we'll apply for a grant to buy this rack for all of our buses. They're about $1,200 a piece, but they are um, good for any type of bike, uh, including the electric bikes. The biggest issue is weight. These are rated, these racks are rated for 75 pounds a bike. And some of those bikes that we've seen are more than that. And uh, we have a limit of two bikes per bus, but we want to try it and we want to make sure we do it. And all of our vehicles, including the ones for micro transit, we want to have some kind of bike rack on for sure. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, and Dave Roberts, this may be the last question we ask of you before you peel. I'm gonna, and I'm going to keep um, Randy and Katie on the hook. Um, Dave, what's the status of electric school buses in Vermont? So uh, there's a few on the roads that have been funded through the Volkswagen diesel settlement. So um, Franklin West Supervisory Union, Barry School District, uh, Champlain Valley. Uh, that might be it. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. Uh, so there, and the idea there is this is a pilot program. So there's analysis and sort of uh, a lot of attention being paid to how the, the buses are working and uh, there will be a report that the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources is overseeing that will speak to you know the experience on uh, those buses in Vermont. The EPA does have funding for uh, electric school buses through the infrastructure bill. Uh, they just awarded uh, grants to Bennington, White River Valley Supervisor Union, Windsor Central, and Caledonia Central, uh, totaling 4.3 million for Vermont schools. Uh, so we do expect to see some additional buses hitting uh, Vermont roads before too long. Uh, so it's, uh, as with transit buses, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, uh, but there, there is some act activity happening. And I know there's some conversations happening between Vermont a and Agency of Education, VTrans, and potentially other partners in terms of you know how to, to really spearhead getting more those electric school buses on the roads in Vermont. You know, does it make sense to have perhaps a and taking a lead in, in supporting communities and uh, getting more of them out there? That's great. And then just following up really quickly, um... Uh, just a question about, are there any vehicle studies happening with electric school buses? You broke up a little bit, but I think um, I did forget South Burlington. Uh, they had, they got funding through a separate um, uh, round of funding and South Burlington is working with Highland Electric with a uh, a program that's doing vehicle to grid. So they're using the batteries to feed power back onto the grid. Uh, that is also sort of a pilot program. I don't think there's been any, the buses are are there. Um, I haven't, so they're in use. I haven't heard anything about the particular experience. I think we'll be hearing more about that in the coming months, but that's a partnership between South Burlington, Highland Electric and Green Mountain Power. Thank you so much, Dave. I know you are very tight on time. Very much appreciate your time. And I, um, if you have to peel off, very much appreciate again. I'm going to turn another question over to, I think, Katie. Um, there's a comment and a question just reflecting on probably something that's true for many small, beautiful Vermont towns. You know, this question is like, we our town is exactly one paved road, no shoulders, no sidewalks, no town center, you know, just a little cluster of buildings. So what organizations or resources or potentially even approach, Katie, might you recommend for the kinds of strategies that you are speaking to? Yeah, I think that's where I would start really with data collection and, and talking to community members about what they would like to see. Um, we're not going like the 
you might have a town that is interested in building or concentrating development in a specific area to build up a, a town center and your town might not be interested in that at all. So in that case, um, you might be looking at bike lanes and walking, or it might just be that, that uh, for your rural town, things like car sharing, carpooling, um, other ways to reduce our emissions is the better option. Um, in some places, I know also that there are there's um, you know walking and, and biking along an unpaved rural road is um, is what we do, and nobody's really um, banging at the door for a paved sidewalk or a paved road, um, and that has worked totally fine for many many years. I know that in some communities that. Um, has come up with some potential safety issues, especially as we have more folks who may be speeding along unpaved rural roads. Um, and so again, I think just having those community conversations to talk about what issues are coming up um, and how to address those is, is where I would start. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I'm gonna ask an, another question of Randy um, related to microtransit. Um, my question to you, Randy, is if you can describe, and you sort of alluded to this in your presentation and your comments, but what um, would you say are some of the key characteristics for a town where my, microtransit might work? And I, and I'm, I also see that we have a couple of fabulous folks from our community action agencies who are also focused on microtransit as in a very important, potentially, um, you know, gap filling solution in our current transportation system. So to the degree, Randy, you have further thoughts on that. Um, I'm just curious what kind of characteristics, if other towns are interested in it, what are the things that you think are, um, are really important to help make that work? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of towns, a lot more towns that are interested in it that really are good candidates. And I don't think I can say or anybody can say that there's one size fits all or there's certain characteristics you can apply across the whole state. When you look at the other um, areas that have pilots, Morrisville, Manchester, Middlebury, Barrie, um, they're all different towns, different, totally different demographics. And even in our little counties, Windsor is totally different than Brattleboro. It's totally different than Montpelier. So I wish I could tell you that um, there's a certain set of characteristics and you need to be in here. But when we looked at the 35 towns in our region, we looked at population. It had to be pretty good sized. It needed to have, the if we're going to keep it to one town, it needed to have lots of different services in it. A hospital was key, but not required. Um, shopping, social services, and a core of residential congregate housing. We thought those were important for our programs. We looked at Londonderry, uh, we looked at Chester, we looked at Ludlow, we looked at quite a few different towns and they each would have been fairly good candidates, but Windsor stood out and Brattleboro we thought about. And then when we got the surveys about the evening service, that became you know really a, a totally important uh, candidate for totally different reasons. That's so great. I just want to say, um, in the spirit of ending on time and respecting everyone's um, busy schedules, um, I'm just very grateful for the expertise, the work, and the time today of our panelists. Um, we're going to follow up with their presentations, um, with the links to the resources that they've provided. This is highly likely not the last time we will be leaning on them and maybe some of you all as we continue um, this work together. I just feel very lucky to have such incredible partners and players um, in this state doing the work you're doing. So thank you all for your time today. And I will give your day back to you and look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow at noon. And then also on Friday at noon, then we're gonna wrap up our 15th annual virtual VCAN conference and ideally be back in person with all of you fine folks and many others um, in the next year. So thanks so much again. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, Dave, who had to run and enjoy the rest of this beautiful, actual snowy day. Thank thanks. you all.